Hi, I'm Kevin Crewell. I'm one of the volunteers at the Computer History Museum, and today I'm going to be interviewing Glenn Henry uh, and his career at IBM, Centaur, and wherever else it takes us. <laughs> so, uh, to start off, uh, Glenn, can you give us a little background of where you're from, what it was like growing up, um, and a little bit uh, where you were born and raised in that general area? Yeah, I was born in 1942, and I grew up in the uh, Berkeley, El Cerrito, the East Bay area. Went to school at El Cerrito High School. So basically, it was a feeder school when I went there to University of California, Berkeley. Uh, our, so our high school was very uh, scientific oriented, very mathematic oriented. And I had uh, had a good high school career, later not so good, I'll come to that. I skipped a grade and uh, started taking classes at Cal when I was a senior, and I graduated when I was 16. So I was off to Cal at 16 years old. Mm -hmm. That was, the fact that we were taking a class uh, at Cal while we were a senior was sort of unusual. The local paper actually put an article in it about such a thing. Now it's uh, much more common that high school people can go to college. So I was, interested in computers from sort of day one. Why, I don't know. I remember when I was 12, trying to build a uh, tic-tac-toe computer out of relays. Uh, I remember my mother taking me to the uh, library, you know, engineering library at Cal to, when I was, uh, I don't know, high school, I guess, to get books on uh, things. I specifically remember reading about uh, multi-stable, uh, bi-stable multi-vibrator, <coughs> which I couldn't understand. Uh, basically a flip-flop in today's but terminology. Cool, but uh, what's that? It sounded cool. Yes. But they taught us nothing about computers in, uh, in high school. There was no sign of computers. But when, we were, when I was a junior, we did a field trip up to Cal where we saw the six, IBM 650, which they had in the engineering department, and I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I, they described it a little bit, and it seemed very interesting. Were either your parents um, into science and engineering? No, my mother was an elementary school teacher. My father was a machinist, mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, but they just stressed education. Okay. And then uh, you sort of, sort of gravitated towards computers as you... Well, I was interested in computers. Uh, I didn't gravitate right then. If I can continue the story. So I started off good in college at 16, but this was uh, Berkeley in the early 60s, and quite bluntly, there's too much distraction for an immature person like me, and I dropped out after three years uh, to work as a helicopter pilot. There's a whole other segment there. So I worked as a commercial helicopter pilot and instructor for a year. Uh, still doing nothing with computers. Uh, at Cal, I had a new major every quarter, but generally centered around mathematics. Mathematics was my uh, great interest. So for a very variety of reasons, I decided that being a helicopter pilot wasn't a good career. And so at 21, I uh, left it, and I got a job as a lab technician at Shell Development, uh, which is the research arm of Shell. And about a few months into the job, this is 1963, by the way, a few months into the job, uh, they said uh, they just got a new computer, an IBM 7040. No one in the department knew how to use it, and so they wanted me to go down and figure out what it could be done with it. So in 1963, I learned how to program the IBM 7040 and started writing applications for our department, which was a spectroscopy department. We would run spectrums on various devices and analyze them to see what the chemical was. And in about six months, uh, I had my own office. The chemists were coming to me because the computer was such a valuable tool, right? Uh, in fact, I published something like seven technical reports there in my two years at Shell. So that was my first experience 
uh, with a computer and it convinced me that's really what I wanted to do. I make a comment, it was hard to learn in those days because uh, there were no books, there, we had no copiers as we know them today, so you had to go to the machine room and read the manuals. And that's how I learned program. My programs were in both Fortran and a similar language, which was called IMAP for some reason, for the 7040. Is it yourself taught? There was no courses? There was no? No. Yeah. I'm sure there might have been some somewhere, but no. I just went down to the computer room and hung around and read the manuals, talked to the operators, you know, that type of thing. And then uh, where did that lead to next? That led to me uh, going back to school. Cheryl came to me and uh, the department head said he, he, they would promote me to chemist, even though I didn't have a degree because I was doing good work. But he also said that I shouldn't accept the promotion, I should go back to school. Uh, along my career, I've had some really wonderful mentors, managers, people that helped me. I think my career is really a function of uh, obviously the right time, the right place, and the right people. The, I was just a lab technician, but I was treated very well, uh, taught a trade, and encouraged to go back to school instead of staying and taking their big raise and becoming a, quote, chemist. So I went back to school, not at Cal, but at the uh, Cal, what's now, Cal State University East Bay, because I wanted to, now that I had seen computers and loved them, I wanted to get finished right away. So I had a plan. They had a summer session, which Cal didn't at the time. So I figured I, I had a plan to graduate in a year, which I did. And at Cal State University, which was Cal State Hayward then, easier for me to say, they had an IBM 1620. And within a very short period of time, they literally gave me the key to the computer room. I was the most experienced programmer there. They had one programming class which taught you how to write assembly language for it. I ended up later in graduate school teaching that. But uh, I just programmed all in assembly language on the 1620. So when it came time to graduate, the head of the math department, oh, my degree, by the way, is in mathematics, not engineering. It was, and it was real math. In those days, that's what, there were no computer science classes. Uh, anyway, I got ready to graduate, and the head of the math department came and said, if I would stay and get a master's degree, they could get me a research grant to work on the computer. And that sounded like a good idea, so I uh, was the first at this, Cal State Hayward to get a, this research grant, which was from a consortium of uh, Western colleges headed by UCLA. It's called Western Data Processing Center. So I got a research grant, $2,000, and uh, I got a uh, master's degree in a year, as well as doing that, as well as uh, working part-time, and it was a part-time job, which I'll mention in a second, that got me to IBM. Okay. All right, so anyway, all I'm doing is computer stuff. Technically, my master's degree is in math. It was real math. It was uh, set theory, topology, things like that. But what I was doing was programming night and day, literally. I had the key to the computer room and sort of ran it. At one point during the year, uh, the math department steered a company to me that had come to them and asked for help. It was a fiberboard corporation. They had a paper plant out in Antioch. And I was hired part-time to do two things. One was to teach their engineers programming. So I got them hooked up with teletypes with a basic system. And I taught basic programming to them. But the other problem they had, they had exploding milk cartons. Uh, without going through the details, uh, they asked me to figure out a way that they could, in real time, manage the moisture in their paper as it was coming down the line. The, the, the paper, would, it's a continuous process, logs go in here, paper comes out there, and in the middle, the paper goes through a series of rollers, and so the temperature of the steam, the speed of the paper, the pressure of the rollers determines the moisture content. 
And if there's too much moisture, later when they try to melt the polyethylene, which is what's coating classic milk cartons, uh, wa the water turns to steam and it breaks. So I very quickly built a model in BASIC, uh, collecting because they had tons of data, collecting parameters from the paper machine. And I could predict accurately, given these measurements, exactly which rolls were good and which were bad. But of course, that was meaningless. By the time I did the measurement, the paper was gone. So I went to research real-time control computers. And uh, along the way, I discovered, I went to look at IBM. Uh, they had a thing called the 1130, but it didn't have analog I.O. and wasn't suitable. But they whispered to me that they had a new computer, the IBM 1800, which had analog and it was really a real-time control computer and it was coming out any day now. So very soon after that, I had to drop the project at Fiverr Board because it was time to graduate with my master's degree. And I interviewed quite a few places, but one of the places I interviewed was with IBM in San Jose, where they were developing the 1800. Uh, there was a small group called Small Scientific and Real-Time Systems, something like that. And I really was interested in that, and uh, it was a small group, and I didn't know it at the time, but I really like working in small groups. Uh, and I had the choice of, at IBM of even either working on a small group like that or going into the giant 360 programming where thousands of programmers were grinding away on an operating system for the 360. And I th I've always believed that I would have never been seen again. <laughs> you know, I, there were things about this small group that helped make me sort of a star at IBM. But anyway, that's how I got to IBM. I turned down higher offers, satellite control and, and things like that because I wanted to work on real-time process control computers, it seemed like. Very interesting. Okay. Glenn, could you take the mic pack out of your pocket? Mm -hmm. Leave the cable on top, just might be shaking a little bit. And you can just place it on the ground right next to you, sir. Yeah, exactly. Okay, am I rambling too much, Kevin? No, you no, want no, to do short? This is the whole point, thank <laughs> you, sir. Okay. The whole point, we wanted to capture all of it, so that's good. All right. All right, so you wanted to be, ready to go back? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. All right, so you wanted to be in real-time control systems, but that was an interesting field to be in, and, and mm -hmm. IBM was just entering that, or was having a scientific computer, and, and they were based in San Jose. Is that South San Jose? Area? Yes, uh, South San Jose. Okay, so you, you, went up, you, you took the offer from IBM, and what happened next? The group also had uh, the 1800, which is a real-time control system, and the IBM 1130, which was just a small scientific Fortran system. And again, luck. The day I was hired, someone quit or left, and I was placed in a special group which was working on designing the next small computer system, even though I just walked in the door. Uh, so I started, I did a lot of things in the first two years, but uh, one of the things I did was start working on the design of the next, IBM's next small scientific system. This was going to be called the 11LC, it was going to, that was the internal code name, it was going to replace the 1130. And so there was a small group of us, six or seven people, and I was in charge of sort of the guts of the operating system. Another guy was doing basic, one guy was doing I.O. And one day, this is gonna be a pattern at IBM, one day IBM management came to us and said they didn't wanna invest the money in a new processor. Why don't we use the processor that they just developed up in Rochester? So we said, sure, maybe, who knows. So a guy came down from Rochester, Don Costello, who later worked for me when I was in Rochester, and what they had developed in Rochester was a small business computer. Uh, jumping back a little bit, before this time, the, the IBM's, probably their biggest business was unit record. This is punch card stuff, key punches, card readers, 
uh, IBM 407 accounting machines, rooms full of these things, because that's how payroll was done, that's how billing was done, accounts receivable. Computers were just now starting to do this, and computers were huge and very expensive I, uh, at that time. And so what IBM had developed was a replacement to all that card equipment, I think, a family of computers called the System 3. And it was card oriented, it had a new card, a 96 column card, not the big 80 column card you've seen. And it was to move people from wired panel uh, card equipment into stored program. You know, these things had a disk, had a disk, you had a program. The language they sort of invented to do this was called RPG, a weird language, but it's perfect for doing these commercial applications. And they had developed a computer, and uh, it had a, you know instruction set. And they came and told us about that, and it was the worst instruction set ever invented for engineering and scientific. It had no general purpose registers. It was a memory to memory. It had two index registers, no multiply, no divide. You know, on and on. It was just. It was a joke, but of course, this is the first of, I think, three times IBM pushed me into a bad instruction set. Uh, so they said, that's what you're going to use. We said, all right. And then they said, by the way, we're transferring the project to Boca Raton. Okay. So after a year and a half in San Jose, I was sent to Boca Raton. Now, during that period of time, I got two promotions in a year and a half, so I was doing well. And when I got to San Jose, a couple guys went, uh, when I got to Boca Raton, a couple guys had gone, come from San Jose, but mostly there were new hires and stragglers from other groups. But basically, we built the System 3 Model 6 Basic. Now, downstairs, I have a complete system. This was the first system that I was really involved with working, and I was the manager of the, of the operating system. And it was the first, in my opinion, the first IBM PC. You had a keyboard, you had a CRT, you had a printer, you had a removable disk drive, a fixed disk drive, uh, and it was an interactive basic system. Now, so... It wasn't, it wasn't the file basic, it was interactive basic. Interactive basic, or yes. Interpretive. Yes. So it sounds like a personal computer. There was a couple of flaws that weighed you when you see it. It weighed about 1,300 pounds. <laughs> and uh, it cost, I don't know what, $20,000 probably. Uh, so it wasn't very commercially set successful. But what's interesting, there were two or three people in that group, of, including me, that ended up doing very well at IBM. So the project was lost, but the opportunity we had to build it, because it was a high quality system, we did, our basic ran in a 64K virtual memory, but the system, the system RAM was only 8K. So we were doing interactive basic with 64K virtual memory. All the virtual memory is all done in software. There's no hardware support at all. This was a, the, the hardware was a system three. They just took the guts of a system three and put a keyboard and a CRT on it. Uh, so it was a, a I think I'm very proud of that project, but of course, commercially, it didn't go very far. Later, the software was reused in a, another IBM project where they actually emulated the System 3 so they could use our software. That's the thing called IBM 50, 5100. It was a predecessor to the PC. So we went through System 3, Model 6, Basic. Then there was the IBM 5100, and finally you get to the IBM 5150, which is, we own, which is the PC. Anyway, so I did that for a year and got another promotion. And I was put in charge of a software group and a hardware group that was developing, that was supposed to develop the new GSD architecture. GSD was the name of our division because everyone realized that the System 3 architecture, the simple thing I told you about, wasn't a very good architecture. So we were going to build a subset of the 360. The IBM 360 is a good general purpose architecture. In fact, it, it's the reason IBM sort of took over the computer business. It was so good. So we we're going to build a subset of the hardware 
and my team was going to build new software because the software for the 360s was batch oriented commercial stuff. We were going to build an interactive, you know, thing. Uh, so we're doing that. We're writing specs. Uh, I wrote an APO model of the hardware. And one day, IBM comes and says, you know, we really don't need a new computer. We have that System 3 thing <laughs> up in Rochester. And I started giving the list of why that was sort of shitty architecture. <laughs> and then they said, well, you're, you're right. So why don't we send you to Rochester? <laughs> you can improve things up there. So I was sent to Rochester after uh, two, two and a half years in um, Boca Raton with another promotion. In my first four years at IBM, I got four promotions, uh, which was considered you know, a world record. So off we go to uh, Rochester, Minnesota. I'll put in a segue here. So I met my wife in Boca Raton. We were engaged to be married. So when IBM said, we want you to go, I was going to be a second line manager in charge of a new computer in Rochester. I said, well, I have a fiance over here. They said, Da, don't worry, we'll get a good job for her there. Oh, she was working for IBM. <laughs> uh, so you can imagine what happened. When we get to Rochester, I'm a second line manager, rising star, there's everyone there. And I say, well, there's my wife. And they say, what wife? Oh. See, we'd gotten married on the way, so she ended up getting a lousy job. She got a job, but it wasn't a good job. And here we are in Rochester. She's from Florida. I'm from Northern California. And we'd never seen anything like the weather there. However, that was my longest stay at any IBM location, which we'll get to. Shall I continue? Sure, I bet that's ironic though, right? weather of all <laughs> yes. the locations you were at, that your stuff, you were at the longest. Right. It was the project I'm getting to, which is sort of... Yeah. Is there any reason why they were obsessed with keeping that instruction set alive when they had a perfectly good 360 instruction set that they could subset? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of politics and, of course, the System 3 was doing very well. It sold very, very well. It was the lowest cost. They had many models, but it was the lowest cost IBM system, and it did a good job. If you wanted to do billing, inventory control, sales analysis, payroll, you name it, a small company, it's perfect. So in, we're in Rochester, and I was the second line manager of this, the system software, languages, utilities, and operating system for a new computer. And this computer was, was a commercial computer. It was designed to be even a lower cost, interact, sort of one person version of the System 3. The System 3 was a fairly big computer and it was card oriented, even though it had a disk. This was a computer that was going to be a desktop thing, but it was going to be commercial. It had a keyboard, a very small CRT, a printer, removable disk drive, what have you, and it was going to be very low cost. And, uh, the no, terminal, no terminal supports? Or just uh, no, this is before so terminal supports. They had BiSync, which was a sort of batch communication okay. line. But it would run RPG, so again, for small businesses. Uh, it, to keep it, keep it low cost, they, were, they weren't using the System 3 CPU. They had a, uh, the engineering group had developed a very primitive uh, uh, microprocessor, right? You know, microprogram. So, and it would do all the I.O. control. So it's, it would emulate a System 3 and do I.O. control. So you'd emulate the System 3 instruction set and run the operating system on System 3s. Had to be modified. That's what my group was doing. I looked at that and said, this is crazy. The System 3 is really slow. You've got this thing here. It's a lot faster. I mean, the System 3 emulation was very slow. You've got this thing that's a lot faster. It talks directly to the disk. So I took on the project myself personally of rewriting the guts of the disk operating system in the microcode. Fortunately, the engineering group 
was amenable to this. And so this was, this was later a theme of my IBM, moving stuff from high levels into the hardware. When I say microcode, it was really just 16, it was just a 16-bit, you know, vertical instruction set, nothing. Hard to write, very simple, had, you know, I think it had 16 registers. This but was, a, was it a monolithic uh, chip? Was no, it no, it was a whole board, board of chips. I, uh, so by moving the disk operating system into microcode, we made it a lot faster than if it had to emulate, uh, you know, this, run the disk operating part of it in yeah. System 3. Most of the software was still in System 3, but the, the key performance element was going to the disk and back. I remember watching the uh, 1972 Olympics, so that's where we are, <laughs> sitting in my uh, room coding this. My son was born in 73, so I remember it was just about the time I was done working on this. So this is the 72, 73 period. Uh, that got me my first award at IBM. You know, IBM has a sort of award system, and you get to go to a recognition thing once a year. You get to bring your wife, which is nice. IBM pays for a wife to come. Uh, and uh, that was the first time I got an award. At the, that project, that computer became the IBM System 32, which before the PC was the largest selling IBM computer. A very good small business, very inexperienced, maybe $1,000 a month, which is dirt cheap in those days. I have one downstairs, a complete one. Uh, so, near the, at, near the end of that project, I guess 73, 74, uh, management came to me and said, we want to build a uh, new computer in the System 3 family that's much more powerful, et cetera. The original System 3 had only a 16-bit address, so 64 bits of memory, and you know, no multiply, no divide, very limited. They had, at the same time I was doing the System 32, they had done another version, the System 3 Model 15, which had extra memory registers so could address more memory. But it still was a very limited instruction set, and the software was very limited. So there's no virtual memory. Just no, yeah, very simple. So I was given the job to get a group together to start designing what we wanted the architecture and the software to be in a brand new computer. Uh, so we were sort of given for a while a clean sheet of paper. So we went wild. Uh, Fred Brooks talks about the second system effect. You know, you design a system, and then your second system, you overdo it. You try to f fix all the things you, you, you know, you weren't smart enough until your third system. This was my second system. I remember we, st I, there was a ACM article or something about the 10 great steps forward in computing, right? I remember we were sat there and read that, and we ended up doing seven or eight of those things. I'll describe what it is. What it is. This is the most important IBM project. This is what got me to be an IBM fellow. There was another one after this, etc. But basically, we decided that we would build something totally different than System 3, other than could run the same languages. We decided to not only do virtual memory, to do a single level store. That is everything, files, you name it, are all in the virtual address space. There's no distinction. So where today, you read it from a file, you read the program that's in a file, exe, and you load it into your virtual memory area, which is another area of memory. We executed it where it was. Everything's in virtual memory. To do that, we had to have a huge address, and so the, so the hardware actually had a 48-bit address. This is in the mid-1970s. I mean, it's just amazing. Beyond that, we said, we're going to be highly secure. We spent a lot of time, at about this time, the government was issuing, uh, I forget the color of the books, orange books, 
<laughs> you know, books on uh, secure operating systems, what they wanted, uh, FIPS requirements. So we said, well, the most critical thing to do is protect pointers, addresses. So we said, we'll, have, we'll do capability addressing. That is, the hardware had an extra bit in every 64 bits, or was it 32? I don't even remember now. But that extra bit could be accessed only by the operating system, and that indicated it was a pointer. So you couldn't add to a pointer. You could call a system function to manipulate a pointer, right? right. Uh, then we said, there's this new thing we read about being done in the San Jose Research Lab, which is a relational database. A da IBM databases, of course, was a big deal at IBM, but databases were totally different then. Right? And this thing sounded very cool, relational database, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a table yeah. format. So we said we should have one of those. And then I said, and this was extremely controversial, this caused a seven-year argument but it turns out to be one of the, it still is important to IBM, I'll get to that. I said there will be a high level machine interface. We will not expose the hardware instructions in. Uh, so we built a high level machine interface and it was really high level, it was object oriented. Now that was another thing, object oriented with protected pointers, a 40 bit single level store thing and the hardware is down here. We had considerable amount of quote microcode, but it was just written. You know, it's written in C and yeah. wasn't written in C. It's written okay. in PL1, our system yeah. language, up to here. And my idea was that, of course, that the hardware is going to change every year, every two years. You can do more. So why not? Why change your software? Right. right. Let's Maybe make. We'll call it a hardware abstraction later. Yes. But that was very controversial. People didn't want it because it was, slow, it was going to slow us down. It did slow us down. It slowed us down the first machine. But that interface has survived. It's still there in IBM. I'm going to tell you the origin of it. So the concept worked. We made that interface really high level. We divided this, what you think was an operating system and the stuff above called the CPF control program feature and stuff below which we called VRM virtual machine resource or something like that. Uh, and uh, said, well, let's just go do this. Now, at the same time we were doing this, IBM had decided to, to replace its entire 360 line. And they had a giant thousands of people working on architecting a replacement. And amazingly, they had the same sort of high level concepts, but they had a much more complicated thing, right? Um, so in one sense, if you read some of the articles, they'll say that what we did was build a subset of that system, but we really came to it independently. And I forget its name, which is embarrassing, but it was a giant, replace the 360s, all of them, right? right. Hardware, software, thousands of people working on it. And we're sitting there in the cornfields of Rochester, you know, doing, and doing this thing. Minnesota. That's Rochester, Minnesota, yes, not New York. Uh, so this was controversial for lots of reasons, and all along the way we had audits after audits. IBM has a, a very focus on audits where they bring in experts from all other fields. You come, they would come sit in my conference room for two weeks, I'd present charts, they would argue, they'd fight, they'd make a report, right? And uh, so anyway, I spent seven years doing that. Manage, I managed all of the software, which at the end was about 600 people, which was a decent sized group. So I come up with the original concepts, or I and this team, a small group, they became my managers. We grew and we grew and we built this, this software. It was a control program, the VMs, VRM. Also had languages, COBOL and RPG, and a pile of utilities, uh, sorts and crap like that. And uh, we announced it in, it was announced in the fall of 79, and then we missed the, 
miss the ship date, which is a sin in IBM of, <laughs> of great proportions, yeah. because there's a long lead time to these kinds of systems. Yeah. People have, especially someone totally new. This is embarrassing to admit, but I'll tell you. One time I was talking to my manager, Brian Utley, who was a really good guy, a big, a big IBM manager. I was in charge of all the software. There was a hardware manager, and he was sort of the system manager. And uh, we were talking about compensation. He said, you know, if you want to get more money, you need to get this thing announced. So I went out to get it announced. And the way you do that, there's a separate group in IBM, a system assurance group that has to sign off and everything. There's a, IBM has a process manual this thick. First, you know, you do all this, so you have reviews, you have specs, people sign off. And we just ran over system assurance, right? Every, every objection they had, I had 13 proofs why that was a stupid objection, right? And by God, we got it announced. And this is a big deal on IBM to announce a new system because this thing's nothing like the System 3, the software is totally different, etc. System 38 announced uh, summer of 79 and we immediately then realized that we weren't going to ship it in time. I guess it was announced summer of 78, I can't even remember now, but basically we ended up having to ship the delivery date a year, and that was a big deal. My boss was called up to Armuk. I was called up to Armuk, and I still remember one of these things, sitting in a room, and out there are all IBM vice presidents, uh, lab directors, vice presidents, and my boss, Brian Utley, is there, and that the group of other is questioning me, what do you think, do you think you can do that, when can it be, et cetera, right? And uh, I'm trying to answer the truth, and Brian is speaking up. I remember Chuck Branscombe, who was, who was actually, has an oral history, great, great, greatest IBM manager I know. Chuck Branscombe spoke up and said, Brian, keep quiet, let Glenn answer. <laughs> Tell the truth, Glenn, so I told him, because Brian was trying to say it was a three-month slip, maybe a six-month slip. I said, no, it's a year. At this point, if we're going to slip, we've got to do it right, right? We're going to take a year, and we're going to do it right. And Chuck said, okay, and that's what we're going to do. And they all went without me into the corporate management committee where they basically beat Brian up. Brian wasn't fired, but he, got a, he was sent to the penalty box for two years. Later, he came back and had a big IBM job because he's very capable. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and every day, the lab, the lab manager at that time would come by my office and he'd come and say, you know, Glenn, I think maybe we ought to fire you today. Nah, I guess you're too high. We won't. <laughs> this went on for a year. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but anyway, that system, the System 38, was shipped. It was underpowered. The hardware was underpowered. We had to make. We made it run in 128k, which was big for the day, but small for the thing. Uh, later, of course, they added more hardware, a bit more memory. They added more. Hardware later in the 80s, it was announced as a, a new system was announced as the AS400, same architecture. The S400 later in the 2000s became the ser Series 1, I guess. Later that became the P System 1 or the P Series 1, something like that. Um, that architecture, if you look it up, is still around. It's the same characteristics. The Sets, grow, the address has grown from 48 bits to 64 bits now, but the high-level machine interface, object-oriented interface, is, is still there. Uh, so it was a scalable design, designed to, it lasted a long time. Yes, and it's still going. The AS400 was very successful, and that was, I mean, it's hard, in retrospect, it's easy to say I was right at the time, the concept of not writing to the iron was just 
amazing, right? People would do crazy things to save, you know, memory. While we were doing the opposite, we were we were eating memory, and I remember I keep saying, okay, okay, maybe it'd be a little underpowered on day one, but the software won't have to change. It's not the hardware; it's the software. Stupid, except you don't say stupid at IBM, but that was the theme. Later, three. Anyway, not, we're up to 1980, the thing ships, and my wife says she's leaving Rochester. I could come or not come. <laughs> it been, remember, it had been not, nine years total now. Yeah. We moved in 71, and uh, IBM founded, IBM told me they would move me to wherever I wanted to go inside of IBM and make a job for me or find a job. So I moved to Austin and they made a job for me. And I will stop here except one more thing. Two years later, I got a very significant, what's called a corporate award, which is big money, several tens of thousands of dollars, which was big in the 80s, yeah. from IBM for the single level store and high level machine concept, which were really, I was the driving force there. And that, of course, became what was the significant factor. Uh, there's one more system I'm going to tell you about at IBM that also, I think, factored into getting to be an IBM fellow, but that the System 38 was certainly a significant step, step in there. Jim, take a break, Lisa. What's that? Let's take a break, Lisa. No, I'm fine. So we're up to 1980. I moved to Austin. And if you moved to Boca Raton, maybe you would have been in the uh, 5150 group. Yes. But I did, and I moved to Austin because I'd been in Boca. So Austin looked like a good place to live, and it was. But there's no job here. So they said, why don't you be our ad tech manager? Ad tech is advanced technology. It's always a group in the lab. The organi IBM's organized in the laboratories. They have product development groups, always have sort of their own research or advanced technology group. Said, uh, there's this, why don't you do an ad tech group? And by the way, here's a group over here that's building something we don't know what to do with, so you take it. And that thing that was, they were building that they didn't know what to do with was a risk processor, a little, a small 32-bit risk processor uh, called ROMP for research, or in a research office multiprocessor, something like that. Um, so they were just building a risk processor because IBM Research had done work on risk in the late um, 70s, a thing called the uh, 801, but it was not, they had never shipped any risk. So this was just a bunch of good technical guys uh, doing this thing. So I gathered up that group and then I said, well, what are we going to do with it? So I said, what we're going to do is build an engineering and scientific workstation. There were no such things in 1981. Uh, by 1984, several companies had built one, a company called Apollo, and what was another company? But basically the concept was, again, a workstation. It was called, sort of, a, they used the term 3M was the buzzword. Uh, three, you know, a million pixels in an all points addressable display. That was fairly new. One MIPS of computing power and one meg of memory, right? 3Ms. That was your engineering and scientific workstation. That's what Sun, I can't think of the name of the company that first did it, but Sun did it, you know, like in 1985 or so, right? We were going to do one. We were going to be first. Also. Uh, yes, they were later. Yeah. But yes, in the late 80s, there were several of these things out there. They were called engineering and scientific right. workstations. The su original Suns were a good example. Yeah, Silicon Graphics. A couple other companies have gone out of business, but we were going to be the first. So I got a processor, but I have no operating system. I just spent seven years managing an operating system. So I said, we're not going to build an operating system. We're going to find one. Well, no, none, nothing that IBM had was any good. In the meantime, this uh, project, they had to replace the 360s. It died of its own inertia, thousands of people, and they're back to building three, six, 370s now, but mm -hmm. that product line. Uh, so I said, let's go and 
let's pick up the, this thing I've read about called Unix. Unix was just very few people in IBM have heard of it in 1980, 81, right? Uh, it really just become sort of visible on like I think 78 or so. Yeah. Um, Data General, is that What's that? Data General. Uh, I know Data General. I don't, did they have one? No, oh. in scientific I don't think so. I think they built a more of a mini computer, it wasn't yeah, a workstation. Right. Yeah, there are many computers. And DEC was doing many computers. So I said, let's go get Unix. And then I said, well, we need a partner for applications. So we ended up going to Carmegie Mellon University and sort of they were our partners. And here's a IBM story for you. So I've got this thing, there's a risk processor. I don't have this thing, I've got a proposal chart. A risk processor, a Unix operating system which nobody above me had heard of in, at IBM, and we'll build an engineering workstation. And remember, IBM is very, very commercial and business oriented, not engineering oriented. And in particularly, Rochester at this time was the home of office products division. And they were building a thing called the Data master, uh, but basically a word processor. They had another word processor. They, they were building word processors, right? St standalone and networks, but specialty systems. Now I want to build an engineering workstation system. And so, yeah, I'm in the manager of ad tech, but to do this took, was going to take more money, right? Yeah, got to build hardware. So. I went to my boss and said, I'll take some more money for this great idea. He said, well, I don't know. Why don't you go see my boss? I literally went from boss to boss till I reached John Akers, who was one step below the IBM president and a year later was promoted to IBM president. <laughs> and I remember now, I, this is just one of those memories you have. I don't remember lots of things. I remember being up in White Plains somewhere, or maybe Armagh, presenting to John Akers this idea I have and the need for some more money. And I'm making foils and in the back, and John's sitting there, and in the back of the room, there are all the bosses between me and here, about four of them who have all turned me down, right? And I get to the end and say, you know, the final chart of course says, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna build this, it's gonna cost this, I'm gonna do it this time, right? This is, and an interesting management technique. Mr. Akers reaches over, grabs that foil, folds it up and puts it in his pocket, saying, you go do that and I'm gonna remember what you told me. I'm <laughs> sure he forgot about it, but he became IBM uh, CEO, not IBM president, IBM CEO the next, the next year. And what's interesting is I never got any change to my official budget. I just went around after a meeting and said, well, I've been to Mr. Akers and he said, build it. So can you please get me two of these and one of these? And I collected 50, 60 guys and we're building it. We, got, we had a deal with a commercial vendor who I can't remember now to do Unix, that we were gonna modify Unix and they were provide a base Unix and uh, the hardware guys were building the processor and going to build, you know, frames and covers. It's going to be an engineering scientific workstation. And uh, <laughs> along the way, the rest of right, so I've got 50, 60 guys. There's 400 people over here in Austin building a follow-on to the Oh, was the display writer, that was the name of the thing. That's a standalone word processing right. system. 400 people building a follow-on. We would roll our eyes and say, glad we're not them. One day I got called in a boss's office and said, we're really gonna help you, Glenn. We think your idea is good. We're gonna kill that project over there and we're gonna give you these 400 people. You know, it's a kiss of death. And then, by the way, I know you're building engineering scientific, but why don't you do some, why don't you make it a commercial system too? <laughs> so 400 people that I don't need nor want are probably pissed. <laughs> and why don't you build, make it a commercial system too? So we spent an extra year and a half from the schedule we would have made with the engineering scientific thing 
putting in more features so it could be a commercial system too. And by the time we'd done that, we were a year late to the marketplace. This thing became the IBM RISC Technology PC or RTPC. You can look it up, it shipped. But again, it's a forerunner of something else. Okay? This was the first IBM system to ship with a RISC processor and with IBM Unix, which we called AIX. AIX is now a huge thing. That's what the IBM systems run on, uh, mainly the mainframes. Because we'd taken Unix and we'd, Unix was pretty rough in those days. <laughs> we'd put in all these user interface things and utilities and this, that, and the other thing. So uh, at the start, I was just managing the software. By the end of this, I was managing the software and the hardware. And again, that system wasn't successful in itself, but it beget two things. It beget AIX, which became uh, important, and it beget, it was the first RISC system, and it was followed by a project here in Austin to do their power architecture, which is our current RISC thing. And I was planning, I was assuming I would get to manage that, but one day they called me in and said, we're making you an IBM fellow. And uh, we're going to bring in uh, Andy Heller to manage that other thing, uh, which was fine because IBM, I wanted to do IBM fellow work, which I'll come to in a second. So, so I was a manager of three systems at IBM. The System 3 Model 6 Basic, no one ever heard of. <laughs> system 32 Software, which was IBM's best seller before the PC. The System 38 Architecture and Software, and uh, the RT, which was a big deal. And the RTPC, uh, which was again from one of my ideas, which wasn't per se that big a seller, but it led to two other things. In fact, Late in that project in 84, 85, we created the IBM AIX project office because it was clear that IBM was going to need new software, right? And my group was building, when I left it to be a fellow, my group was working on uh, very small kernels, you know, micro kernel things to run underneath Unix, what have you, sort of, uh, again, a forerunner of the future. So that's my IBM experience, 21. Oh, I haven't finished my IBM experience. I just was made an IBM fellow, 18 yeah, years. Right. What am I doing here? Okay. So my two fellow projects. The first was an audio, video, visual computer. Well, let me explain something. Can you explain the, 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 the program, uh, the fellow program? Okay, right? yeah, IBM fellow is a great deal. It's a lifetime appointment you can work on whatever you want to work on. You can get a budget. The budget has to be negotiated, but it's not just you. you most fellows have, you know, a small group of people working on it. And that's it. You work on whatever you want to work on. Lifetime appointment, right? <laughs> and it has perks. You get to go every year. In the meantime, I've been to three of the IBM uh, yearly uh, recognition things. You get to go to the recognition thing every year. My wife loved to go to those things. They're always held in the good places and stuff like that. So it is a, a good deal. And in those days, it was much more picky than it is today. Today, they make five or six fellows a year. In my day, it was two or three and four. In the year I was made fellow, one of the other person, who's now, by the way, a professor emeritus at UT, uh, was a research chemist that developed a new thing. Uh, another person, I can't think what, there, IBM, I should explain, IBM fellows almost totally in my day came from research. They were real people. The year after I was made a fellow, uh, two of the IBM fellows won the Nobel Prize, you know, that kind of thing. They were real research uh, people. I had never set foot in research. In fact, I didn't get along with researchers. Oh, yeah. Whole story there. 
Uh, I just developed products, but my products had very innovative things in it that, had, that became important. Uh, but it was very rare for a product developer. I wasn't the only one, but that was rare. Most IBM fellows were research people, and that was sort of their career path and if you're a doctor in research. So, but anyway, when I was doing the RTPC, I remember I'd have to go to management reviews, I'd stand up and say, well, here's what I got, and here's how fast it is, and here's what it cost. And right after that, Don Eskridge would stand up and say, well, I've got a new version of the PC, and here's how much it cost, and here's how fast it was. You know, it's like half the price, but we were 15% faster, or something like that. So I became convinced that PCs were the way to go. So when I became a fellow, I moved myself into the PC group. Uh, no other IBM fellow would get close to PCs, and the whole management chain above me. At that time, as a fellow on fairly high level, I worked, for, my manager was in uh, New York, and he didn't know a PC from anything. They, the IBM thought PCs would be interesting as terminals to their mainframe business. You know, just crazy. But I, I saw what I thought was a PC opportunity. So the first fellow project I did was what we called the audio vi visual PC. And uh, the idea was that a PC, this is 1985-86, which PCs were pretty primitive, that the PC ought to be able to play video, ought to be able to play sounds, ought to be able to capture sounds, do all those things that we now take for granted. They didn't do them in 1986. So we built, I had a small group of people, we built a prototype. There was a PC here and a hunk of hardware here that did sound and a hunk of hardware here that did video. And we took it to Armok and I showed it to John Akers, who's the CEO. And he looked at it and went, that's nice, you know. <laughs> uh, they were worried about other things. I couldn't get any product group uh, interested in it. But, so we took it to a point where, and again, it was the same thing, said, yes, look it, there's this hunk of hardware here doing sound. Next year, that hunk of hardware is one board. The year after that, it's one chip. Can't, can't you guys see? Yeah. No. So no one wanted to build an audio, so I wanted someone to build, the PC group, to build an audiovisual computer. They didn't want to build it. So then I had the idea that leads directly to my life today, 30 some odd years later. I said, it's clear again that the PC is going to take over the world. That means, ugly as it may be, that the Intel processor architecture is going to be very important. Remember, I'd just done a risk processor, and I used to have to give charts on how, look at that 8088 instruction set. <laughs> it makes you sick, doesn't it? Look at my clean instructions, and I got general purpose registers, so I knew all that. But I decided that that processor architecture was going to be key because that's what software's been written in, and software was going to be key. So I decided that what IBM needed to do was take over that marketplace. At the time, 1985-86, IBM had probably the best processor design group in the world. They had great technology out of Burlington. They had really smart people. They were building this giant risk processor. They'd built processors for years. And at the time, People don't remember now, Intel was in trouble. IBM bought 20% of their stock in 1985 to prop them up. So I said, why, why don't we just build a better 486? We didn't know it was a 486, but build a better you know, future x86. And then I said, and the way to do it is take the risk, that power PC, power risk thing you're building, and modify it. This is going to sound familiar. Modify it so it can also execute x86. And that's what we were going to do because across the hall, and actually in another building, was the group, main product group, a couple hundred people designing the power processor. Right. And by this time, I'd gathered up 50 people again. And we were just, we didn't have to build a whole processor, we just had 
to design new instructions and trapping mechanisms, things like that, so that this thing could run both. And my idea was an intercept strategy. It could run the old tired PC crap, but it could also run the new spiffy wrist stuff, which I assume IBM would develop software for, et cetera, right? Uh, well, IBM really hated that idea. The audits came again. For a, a lot of reasons, they, IBM was in, let's do it themselves. They're going to build OS2. I'll come to that because I was involved. So, they're going to build OS2. They're going to build a risk processor. They're going to build the, uh, what is the name of their? Microchannel. Microchannel. Everything's proprietary. Everything's better technically. Yeah. Everything, to, but that better technically didn't matter in any of those things. So. I'll mention the OS2 thing. So as an IBM fellow, I was called to give talks and things. So I was called to Boca Raton to give a talk to the technical community on the future of processors. So I had charts showing processors up and to the right, you know? Uh, and somewhere in that talk, I said, because I just wing it, it's obvious from this, uh, uh, I said something like, and you got to do virtual memory if you, you know, anyone who builds software in, the, in 1986 without supporting virtual memory is crazy. A gas from the audience because it's all the OS2 developers and the original OS2 was done to run only on the 286, which was non-virtual memory, even though Intel shipping the 386 and compacts got one. Yeah. In fact, I was called again, sort of as a technical expert to go to IBM sort of investigation on how come Compax got a 3D6 system and the PC does not. Compax shipped the 3D6 first. And the answer quite clearly was the IBM mentality that sold all these 286s so they had to support the people. They couldn't obsolete those 286s. They didn't realize it's a new world and you better be obsoleting things, right? Yeah. Uh, the 286 was kind of management of uh, virtual space was pretty brain dead. It it's, it's segment yeah. oriented. Yeah. Segment yeah. registers point to different memory sectors. It's terrible. Yeah. Oh, by the way, just before we go ahead, that mythical power PC that can emulate x86, mm -hmm. was, that, I think they, was that the 815 project before? That, I'm coming to that. Oh. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I'm I've, I've now up to 100 people building this and IBM I should mention that the, uh, the key executive in our area, whose name, oh, Jack Keeler, very big IBM executive, he had gone to school with Andy Grove, and, you know, and IBM had invested in him, you know, so I was fighting against the tide. Uh, so this went on till 87, and along the way, there was a key individual. So, I felt I needed some very specific expertise, and it turned out that IBM was building a 386 in Burlington under license to Intel, but they had designed it themselves, you know, looking at all the Intel IP, right? Blue Lightning, I think it was called. Yes, Blue Lightning, exactly, one in my museum. Uh, I went up to Burlington, and I hired the, uh, uh, the, design leader of that group, the logic designer. I remember thinking at the time, this guy's either a genius or <laughs> he's pulled the wool over me. That guy is here today at Centaurs, our lead architect, one of the best engineers I've ever seen. First by the name of Terry Park. Anyway, I built a group, had good people, people like to work for an IBM fellow project, but it was just getting tiresome and tiresome fighting against the tide. And then one day, that we're now in 88, early 88, my wife reports that they think there's a drug dealer moving into our neighborhood. <laughs> so everyone says, well, we live in a good neighborhood. And the most expensive house, which is only one away, there's us, another house, and the most expensive house in the neighborhood. It's a small neighborhood. 
some 23-year-old kid has bought that house. They don't know anything about it, but I mean, what would a 23-year-old do? <laughs> Where would he get the money if there'd be a drug dealer? Well, of course, that was Michael Dell. And he had just founded in 85 Dell Computers, or 86, I'm not clear. But, and he was just in process in early 88 of going public. But anyway, he and I ran into each other and walked. We would walk the neighborhood, right? And he would talk about his philosophy of doing things, and I would talk about what I was doing. And remember, I'm interested in PCs, and he had an awfully good story about PCs. So one day in June or July, I forget, the, I just get so disgusted with IBM. I, th I say I'm going to quit, and I was like only the second, at that time, second um, fellow ever to quit. I'm going to quit and go work for Michael Dell. <laughs> I tell the story of my wife faints. Well, she didn't faint, but, but I mean, leaving the IBM fellow job <laughs> and going to work for a 23-year-old. Uh, but that's what I said I wanted to do. IBM made me go up to Arma to talk to the executives. Why are you doing this crazy thing? Right and mm -hmm. blah blah blah, and uh, put pressure on me not to leave. But it was interesting; they were very upset at seemingly that I was going to leave. But on the other hand, they didn't like my project, you know, my ex my PC oriented thing, my do x86. But anyway, in July of 1988, I quit IBM, leaving a great job and go to work for Michael Dell, and my job was to be the first manager of the R&D group, the product development group, which I'll say a little bit more about. And uh, my project, I had people working on that, my project became the 815. Oh, okay. And it, it lingered for a while and then died. But I had people working on the project. In fact, one of the persons working on my project, in addition to Terry, uh, there's another person here, a first-year person that worked in that, my fellow group. Yeah. And uh, several of the other people here worked on the 815, taken later and worked on the 815, but it went basically nowhere. Uh, so. And now it's Dell. Now So I go in. <laughs> so I find out what the R&D department is. There's six or seven guys working directly for Michael. They have no department, no manager. There's just guys, engineers. Here. And at the same day I started, there was another, a new college hire from UT. He had just hired a guy by the name of Darius Gaskins, who's also one of the founders. So Terry, me, and Darius, founders. Anyway, I go in and there's... Uh, centaur. centaur. I'm lift ahead. Go in there and there's six or seven guys and Michael says, get them organized, make a group, and I want to see us beating Compact. He said, how are we going to beat Compact with six or seven guys? And Michael said, you're going to be lower cost than them and you're going to run faster than they do. You're going to turn out new innovations quicker. And that, of course, always stuck with me and that's one of the themes of starting the company I'm in now, Centaur. So anyway, I gathered people, I hired people, we grew the uh, first three years at Dell. At Dell became a Fortune 500 company. We were doubling revenue, at least doubling every year, it's that kind of thing. There were 700 employees when I was hired. The problem is, I'm a technical person, I ended up within a year managing more than half of the company. Mark, I may be a technical guy, but I've been a manager at IBM for 21 years, 19 years actually, and IBM trains its managers well, right? I hate management, but I knew how to do it. So, uh, in fact, I remember one day Michael called me over to his house, remember he only lives a yeah. house away, and said, I want you to take over manufacturing. I said, I don't know anything about manufacturing. I don't want them, I don't know anything. And Michael said, you're a manager, managers manage. 
you, you now own manufacturing. So very quickly I ended up not only with the R&D group, but manufacturing, IS, technical support, facilities, basically everything with the sales and marketing groups. And I hated my job. Michael knew I hated it, but so be it. Uh, so, Dell grew and grew and grew, and after two or three years, I was able to start getting rid of management jobs, got rid of everything about manufacturing, procurement, and R&D, later worked myself down to R&D, and then Michael and I basically, I mean, I was really hating my job, Michael and I basically came to understanding that I would become CTO and stay for a while and help you know, hire my replacement, mm -hmm. which I did. But in the fall of 2003, I was on my way out. Uh, but I worked for Michael for five years and learned an infinite amount. Uh, and I give him some credit for some of the things we do and credit for some of the things I refuse to do <laughs> because we're not run like Dale. So, in the meantime, I'm CEO, I mean, I'm CTO, CTO of uh, Dell, and I have Terry working for me, my old guy from my fellow group, a processor man, and we would sit around saying, boy, we could design a low-cost x86. Look at that thing. Intel selling something, $150, $180, something like that was the lowest price thing they would sell Dell. And we'd look at it and say, you could build that for 10, 15, whatever. So we wanted to build an XA6, but didn't know how. And one day, I don't remember the details, oh yeah, how we got connected, but a person that had worked for me at IBM, in fact, I think I hired him into IBM, uh, Whiteside, what's his first name? Oh, that's terrible. Can't remember his first name. Last name Whiteside was the president of MIPS at this time. MIPS had, was a company that built MIPS computers, uh, but they were owned by Silicon Graphics. Right. Uh, so I ran into Mr. Whiteside, and we got to talking, and I gave him my story about. I said, "You got a risk-like thing there, sort of in MIPS, but." I know what Intel's doing, and Intel is going to take that ugly architecture and they're going to make it fast. <laughs> and they've got a million people to do that, and you've got 200, and so you should think about that. Anyway, uh, he hired me as a consultant, so I left Dell, had a job immediately. My job is to be a consultant to MIPS to help them develop a strategy for the PC marketplace. At this time, Microsoft actually had a version of Windows NT that ran on MIPS. Right. That was pushed by um, Dell. Dell had a MIPS workstation. At that point. I don't, don't know. Anyway, a week later, Terry quits Dell, to, and I got him a job as a consultant. And a month later, Darius quits Dell and. Uh, got him a job as a consultant too. And there was another person who had worked for me at Dell, Al Sato, and he quits. So there's four of us, we're working as consultants, uh, working out of our homes. I would travel to Silicon Graphics almost every week, but the other guys r rarely would travel. And we were preparing, we wrote specs, we wrote, we did design, we were preparing a strategy for Silicon Graphics to compete with the growing PC capability. And what we found is that the Silicon Graphics executives were unbelievably short-sighted, egotistical, whatever. They said, oh, a PC, that will never threaten us. Intel, they can never build anything as good as our stuff, right? This is five years before they went out of business. <laughs> and four years before they converted to Pentiums or something like that. Uh, 
They just wanted no part of this. It was titanium, actually. Okay. But uh, anyway, so, but they were good about it. They said, well, you've got this idea. I'll describe the idea in a second. If you can sell this idea to some of our partners, because MIPS had all these partner people building MIPS under license, if you can sell the idea to some of our partners, that's good. So you just keep, go ahead and do your idea. So they let us run. But it was up to us, but they weren't going to help us. Our idea at that point was surprised as it may seem. <laughs> A set of instructions to go into a MIPS that would execute x86 as well as MIPS, right? Mm -hmm. And we had a spec, and we really understood x86 by at this point. By the way, when I was, I, when I was an IBM fellow, I was the IBM official architecture representative <coughs> on x86 to Intel. I used to talk to, uh, what are the two guys? Crawford, Crawford and who's the other name? Gelsinger. Gelsinger. Gelsinger, Crawford and Gelsinger. So I know both of them. I would call them and say, your spec says <laughs> instruction does this. We don't think it does that. They say, oh yeah, it doesn't do that. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Uh, anyway, uh, so we kept developing our idea and I started going around to all of the, not all, I went to partners of MIPS to sell this idea. And uh, all but one of the partners laughed. I remember being in uh, Japan. I won't name their name, but they're MIPS. <laughs> they were doing MIPS processors in a big Japanese company, presenting my ideas. And they laughed. And Japanese never laugh at you publicly. <laughs> so it was really bad. Because uh, beyond the technical thing, I now decided that we had to make a company for a couple reasons. And so I was given the argument, we want to create a subsidiary to do this. I want 15-ish million dollars. I want you to leave me alone. No bureaucracy. No one in the corner watch me in. Trust me, we'll have a processor for you in two years. Two years, right? And everyone laughed. And anyway, I met uh, Lynn Perham, who is the uh, CEO of IDT. And they licensed uh, MIPS. They had a 4600 and a 4700 done by a separate company called QED, but whatever. They were sold under IDT name. Uh, and I gave this idea to him. And he said, well, you know, it's interesting. And he said he would send his technical guy, Al Huggins, down to uh, check it out. So his technical guy comes, Al Huggins, a really smart guy. Turned out to be a really good guy, but he comes and he's one of these guys that comes and says, This is all shit. <laughs> you know, I ought to be arrested for proposing. Yeah, what is this thing here? And of course, I know what I'm doing. It sounds terrible to say, but I do know what I'm doing on this. So I answer, Well, this is how it works, and we can do this, and you got a concern there. Yeah, this is. This went on for months, literally. This is in the fall of 19. Of tooth, fall of 19. 93. I think I've got my date screwed up here. I'm sorry, the fall of 1994. Yes. I'd quit Dell in the spring, January of 94. Now it's the fall of 94. Literally went on for months. He'd raise objections. We would go fix them. Show him more objections. He's just kicking the tires and he's good at it. Oh. So in the meantime, Lind takes me in front of his board of directors. And one of the board of directors, I can't remember his name, is a famous processor guy who did the uh, Z8. Uh, do you remember? Oh, the X Intel guy. The X Intel guy. Uh, yeah. Yes. Those... Yes, he was an X Intel guy. Uh, <laughs> and, and so we're saying, hey, we could do this thing and it will be compatible with Intel. And he didn't believe it because he was an X Intel guy and just on and on. But they never threw me out. I went to see the board of directors several times with this idea and it kept evolving. Now, secretly, not secretly, but when we were going through this, we would have talks that went like this. Someone would say, now Glenn, what's the value of those MIPS instructions? 
why don't you just replace that MIPS ad with an x86 ad, right? I said, God, that would actually be easier to do, but I started doing this to help the MIPS people, and so, you know, that's why they're there, right? Finally, in the late uh, March of 1995 now, there's the definitive board meeting, supposedly the last of its type. I wasn't invited in. I was there, sitting in a room waiting. Um, and Lynn came out and said that they had agreed to, uh, to do this and fund a subsidiary company, and let's try this thing. Uh, Lynn is definitely a visionary, deserves an infinite amount of respect and thanks from all Centaurians for this, but he was a visionary. Uh, and Hal Huggins helped us a lot to get started. He later faded away. So here we are on uh, our official uh, birthday is April 1st, uh, so, but it's pretty close. I think we got our first check two days before, something like that. Here we are, four of us in our homes, no equipment, no offices, and we get our first check, and we got to start, and that was the start of, uh, of Centaur. And the name Centaur means two-headed, was two-headed, uh, two, uh, an animal with uh, two it's bodies, a, body and... Well, it's a body, a body of a man, I'm sorry, the top is a man, the body of a horse. And so, but sometimes it's called, uh, you know, a man and a monster, something like that. So our take was, well, the nice man is clearly a MIP still, and that horrible monster is x86, right? That was it. This is a two-headed thing, yeah. however you... Well, it's uh, yeah. However, yeah, at that point in time, you pretty much deprecated the MIPS part of the... Like. Officially, the hour we started, we were doing... We were going to add x86 instructions to MIPS, but quite bluntly, what was in the head and what was on our design quadro tablets was a full x86. It took us a month or two months to officially change within IDT, but Lynn had agreed to it, right? We all knew what we wanted to build. Um, so I was also a, a vice president of uh, IDT and president of Centaur, so off we started. And again, they left us alone. They sent money and left us alone, which was what I asked for. The, I mean, that's, that's all you can look for in a manager, yeah. right? That's a perfect thing. And, um, but I would go out there every couple weeks to give status reports, talk about what we're doing. And we even had a marketing group, Centaur marketing group. Uh, we had a marketing strategy. And the technology was IDT technology. They had a fab there, uh, I think 32, you know, 32 uh, micron, something like that. So very old. <laughs> uh, anyway. And you had two years of roughly to get this design. Okay. Well, we had one year. So uh, something I haven't mentioned, I didn't mention it to the people right away, is the board of directors. Uh, said you should be able to sh tape out a sh chip in one year that can run win uh, that can run DOS and some Windows. So it took me about a month to let people know that. Well, so we had a year, and we did. We taped out a part in 13 months after we got our first check, and it ran DOS and some Windows. And uh, the second version we did was of the part shipped. So we did, we sampled a part two years from when we started and we shipped it, you know, three or four months later. I remember going to the microprocessor forum. This is in the fall of 97 where I introduced it. In, in the movie I gave you, there's actually a clip of me introducing it at the fall microprocessor forum of 1997. And, uh, it was called the IDT Windship. It had a name, it had branding, it had a, people sold it. We had a, you know, a marketing group. And we ended up selling uh, several like, million of those things. It plugged into the 486 octet or the 
socket? Pentium. Pentium socket, yeah. Yes. It was plug compatible. In fact, uh, somewhere in my office, I still have a box from a vendor that sold a plug in, used our part as a plug in, <laughs> you know, for, for Intel. Yes, yeah, plug compatible, perfectly software compatible. We figured no one was going to do any software uniquely for us, so we had to be nauseously compatible. I think in the history of lifetime, Microsoft's written one line of code or something for us. We are just nauseously compatible with Intel because we have no choice. We have to be able to run code that was developed for Intel. AMD has more software research, have more market share, so they get more things uh, done for them. By the way, at the time we started, AMD, the only part they had was x86 was a, they had, they had the part they were selling was an exact copy, you know, a sliced down copy of the Intel part. And they and Intel were in an argument over a microcode at the time. Right. You know, well, it was 486 microcode. Yes. The, I don't know if it was 486 or Pentium, but yes. Because uh, they never yeah. built, the AMD never built the Pentium, they okay. built the K5. But they were going to, but they were building the K5, and I met Mike Johnson. Well, uh, when we were getting, when we were in that six month period we were selling, we met with Mike Johnson and another guy, and they were doing the K5, and we sort of told them our idea, and they told us their idea, and I remember, this is easy in retrospect, but it's true, I remember asking them what their uh, benchmarks were, and their benchmarks were spec, and I remember saying, that's not a good benchmark for x86. Yeah. You guys, there are calls, there are, there, are, there are call gates and all kinds of horrible things and they actually show up in, in code. Uh, so I think we had, they, they were definitely good engineers, but they were coming from the risk, what is it, 2,900? 29,000. 29,000, yeah, which was a pure risk thing. We were coming, we had been PC guys for a long time, <laughs> all the way back to IBM, certainly in Dell, uh, and we knew what the software was like, and this Windows software, this is not efficient, at least in those days it wasn't efficient, and it did all these unnatural, weird instructions and things, you just had to support them. So later the K5 came out and it, it had performance problems. Uh, uh, you know, benchmark problems running the benchmarks of PCs. Uh, so, we're up to 97, we have a part, we're selling, that first part sold a few million, not many, by, by Intel standards, we're with, below the rounding error, thing. <laughs> okay? But I haven't mentioned one reason why I wanted to start a company, I asked over, well, there's three things about starting Centaur. There was the business case. We had a business case. The business case was at the time I was going around selling it, 50% of the PCs in the world were sold in the United States, so 5% of the world population. So my story was everyone would want to have a PC, or want to have some form of computing. So human need. And that most of the PCs in the fullness of time are going to be sold outside the United States and people don't have a lot of money, right? Uh, they certainly don't have the disposable income we have in the United States where we all buy the best set of iron we can. And so we had a business story that said we're going to make something that's perfectly compatible because software is the key and it'll be lower cost. Later we had a lower power, but quite honestly, our first power wasn't important then. It was going to be lower cost, and it said, it, therefore, it will appeal to the 95% <laughs> who aren't buying those Intel things today. So that was our business case. But that wasn't why we started the company. That was the justification. We started the company for two reasons. One was Terry and I wanted to build an x86. Uh, we're processor guys. And x86 was built by Intel to be this thing that you had to have a special sauce to build, no one but the finest wizards mm -hmm. Intel could do it. Remember, this was the period that AMD had not yet shipped their own x86 design that they yeah. finally, you know. But 
Uh, so we wanted to build it because it was a mountain, it was there, it had to be climbed. But the other reason is I'd been managing now for a long time at this point, and I wanted to run a, co a tech technical company the way I thought it ought to be run. IBM was a great company when I was there, but they did a lot of crazy things. <laughs> and I'm, so in my mind were the good things and the bad things. Dell, for what it was, was a very good company, but they did a lot of crazy things, right? So I had the idea of how I wanted to run a technical group. I had, there were bullet points on the chart and things like that. And so we wanted to build on x86. I wanted to run a company the way I wanted it run. And we had a, a reason to be a low cost x86. x86 market's only going to grow low cost. Uh, let me have a drink of water here. Sure. So we built our first part, then we built a second part, and we are working on our third part in 1999 when Lynn calls and says the board of directors has decided they don't want to be in the PC business. I mean, we weren't doing bad, we weren't doing great. Our parts were selling, you know, but um, the board of directors doesn't want to be in the PC business. So we're going to sell Centaur. And he says we're going to take so many months to sell it. We can, and then if you can't get sold, well, that's the end of you. Uh, so I actually went and told the people what was happening and gave them the, uh, uh, those of you that like it here, don't give up. I think we got a good story, but you ought to know that we're going to get sold, right? There's a risk in that. So during the summer of 99, several people came to uh, do due diligence. And at this point, I just realized I've been rambling for hours and I'm not answering your questions. So. That's okay. We're still going where, where I'm talking. Okay. Should yeah. I keep rambling? Yes. All right. So people came to due diligence. And due diligence, they would bring, you know, three accountants, two lawyers, and maybe someone who knew something technically, right? Yeah. And I had a, I still have it, I have a pitch book this thick, you know, each, all the foils in here, that lasted a whole day, the whole story. Here's who we are, here's what we can do, here's our patents, here's our talents, here's our tools, here's the ch number of chairs we have, <laughs> drinks in the future, everything a due diligence team would want to know, right? Yeah. And the technical guy would talk to me and the lawyers and accountants would be off looking at the books or whatever. And they came and nothing happened. One of them was a uh, Taiwanese company. I can't remember his name. But anyway, one day, Wen Chi Chin, the CEO of VIA, a Taiwanese company, calls me on my phone and says, I hear you're uh, being sold. Would you be interested in being bought by me? I said, sure, come on by. So he says, I'll be there in two days. Oh, okay. So I'm preparing, got the pitch book, expecting to crowd of people. So when she comes with this one more, one other person who never said a whole word during the whole thing, I'll tell you about him in a second. So there's just two people. They come, sit in the concert room. I start my Presentation, my presentation is all philosophy. Small is beautiful. Small team can move quicker, can do more. The productivity is great. No overhead, blah, 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 right? Yeah. 30 minutes into it, when she says, this is great. I believe that stuff. I'm with you. I want to buy you. How much should I offer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Well, and you already just bought <laughs> Cyrus or is this? Well, I, yes, but I didn't know that at the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yes, I didn't know that. At the, he never mentioned that. It turned out that the, and we talked a little bit more, and he went off and he called uh, Lynn Perum, and I believe they consummated the deal in two days. It was that straightforward, yeah. or maybe at most a week. It was consummated very quickly. Uh, the other guy was the older brother of Cher, Cher Wang, who's when she's wife and is one of the richest women in China, who's from Taiwan, Taiwan and China, yes, yeah. that all. Uh, 
Her father was the founder of a conglomerate, Formosa Plastic. It's got hospitals, all, you know, uh, uh, lots of things. Uh, so I assume, assume he was the money man, but I don't really know. He never said a, said a word. Yeah. Um, so soon thereafter, the deal isn't final yet, and when she calls me and says they bought Cyrix, and when I go up to meet he and Cher in uh, Dallas and, and do a review of Cyrix. This is like September-ish, I guess. So I go up and, you know, they have a review and people come and they talk and they were about to release a new part. And uh, their part had a problem, had a virtual addressing problem with it. And so I asked them, so you got this problem, yeah. So I asked them to tell me about what they knew about the problem, what they were going to do about it, et cetera. And I didn't like their answer. So anyway, at the end of the day, Cher and when Cher in the office, and they ask me what I think, and I say, that part will never ship. You just do what you will, but that, that part is not going to ship for these reasons. In fact, I, being a young, cocky guy then, I said, and I'll bet you, <laughs> you know, steak dinner or something, that part will never ship. They just didn't make any response. Uh, They were also lots of personnel problems there. The previous owner had done crazy things when they're going to sell them. Uh, I'll go through all that. The upshot is that Cyrix, within two months, dwindled to like ten people or something. Basically, they the whole company disappeared. How much of that was them dwindling on their own, or how, how much of that? was when she, I never knew, but I do know, I mean, I had to be parochial, that's my job here, I do know that I remember presenting when she had chart after that review that said, here's how many people they had, they had 450 people, they had 15 people, you know, with titles of directors or above, right? And at the time I had 60, Centaur was 60 people. I said, here's the story, 60 people, one manager, Everyone else is a worker versus 400 and something. So I made that point strongly because he asked me if I wanted to hire those people. I said no. Well, the, the Cyrix was owned by National, I think, at the time. Yeah. And it was being sold in, a, in National as a subsidiary. Yeah, they had bought it and, you know, they're a smokestack. I shouldn't say that. They're not really a smokestack. But they had, they had fattened it. Cyrix was lean and they had put in vice presidents and directors, the typical thing a big company does. And remember, when she's inherently likes the small, lean yeah. thing. And so we were small and lean at 60 people, there were 400 people, the handwriting was on the wall, but I don't know the details, but Cyrix sort of evaporated. And that part never shipped. What they did was take the part that we had been developing, because we were still developing. I'd kept this team alive. One person, one thing I'm very proud of, during that period, three month period, maybe four month, that we had announced we were going to be sold, one person left. We just kept working on the part. So when we were bought, we had a part. It was ready to tape out. <laughs> and VIA later sold that as the Cyrix, put the Cyrix name on because they thought they had got a brand in Cyrix. But it was our part. Yeah. I forget. There were very limited number of x86 competitors at that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, competing with Intel, AMD was the largest of them. Cyrix was relatively well known in that line of yeah. obscures. And then there were a few other older clones uh, like IBM, Blue um, Lightning. Right, and there were all kinds of people trying to do it. Chips and Technologies, an old company, tried to do it. I mean, lots of companies have startups. That, we're in the, on those days, we're trying to do it. Now I think people would <laughs> be crazy to try to do it. But in those days, because we met with people at conferences, the microprocessor report, there were all kinds of people that would come up to me and talk about doing it. And they all had great stories, how fast it was. And of course, most of the time I didn't, but every once in a while I'd say, so how are you going to handle the bounds instruction? 
Huh? <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was a lot, bunch of oddball instructions and then they were there. You have to take into account in the next yeah. instructions. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, we had a part taped out that fall and shipped the following spring. Things worked asset days. It was labeled as Cyrex, but after that, uh, they didn't use the Cyrex name anymore. All the parts that be shipped are ours. Uh, on my keychain here, except I didn't bring my keychain, we have a little thing where we sold 10 million parts. It was soon after that. It was with VIA, but it wasn't that much longer. You know, we had a little keychain made with a chip in it. Uh, so we were selling a few million a year uh, during that time frame. Is part of the reason you could turn the chip so quick was because you went with a very simplified architecture? You, you kept it as minimal as possible and kept the cost down? It also made the design easier to, to produce? Yes, small, all good things run from small, <laughs> low cost, quick turnaround, small team, small team further begets quick turnaround, right, and low cost, et cetera, et cetera. Going back to the business plan, I had seen firsthand and participated at Dell in the problems of growth, you know. And so I said, right, clear wrongfully, we are just going to be a design company. If our part will sell billions, that's fine. The sales and marketing, the things will be somewhere else, right? We are designers here. And that we are going to be so inexpensive doing our design that the chip just has to sell until rounding numbers to be successful, right? So we, we live a good life here <laughs> and we have good equipment, but we're small. Years and years later, now we're 103 people today, right? And we've been roughly at 100 for the last 10 years. My budget is, hasn't changed more than 20% of what I spend in the last 10 years. So we don't, compared to the tech industry, which you're very familiar with, we spend nothing. <laughs> uh, and that allows us to stay, to stay in business. Now, we're not going to take over the world, but my theory of this business, if I may deviate, is threefold. We want to do good technical work, technical work that's hard, and we want to do it well with quality, and XA6 is a very good test of that. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to have a good life. Uh, people here like but they do. They like working since our turnover is negligible, right? You can find that out lots of different ways. Our turnover is very low. Low people come here, they stay here. We have, of the original 25 people we hired at the end of the first year, 18 are still here. So we're providing, we've provided 22 years now of good life for the people that, that, that we hired. And third of all, we want to try to make a difference. Our difference hasn't been nearly as high as I had hoped, but we have shipped tens of millions of parts. Uh, we stayed in business for 22 years, and the parts were truly lower cost than Intel. The trade-off was twofold. One is the parts weren't as fast as Intel, uh, but they weren't as costly, partly because they weren't as fast, partly because we did it with 26 people the first year, then 50, then 60, and then 100 at peak time. And that money uh, has to be accounted for somewhere. The uh, speed thing has always been a problem to us. Uh, you've heard me, I think. I used to go, for the first seven or eight years, I would go to all the conferences. I think I talked at Microprocessor Forum six or seven years in a row. And the story I was always telling was, you don't need to get a faster PC every two years. You don't need a new chip. Well, maybe you do, you audience people, but ordinary people don't. What do ordinary people do? They browse the internet, they do email, they do spreadsheets, uh, what have you. So I used to give a story in my talk, if I can ramble. I used to say, I know if in my life there are four grades of PCs. At Centaur, we buy the fastest, biggest thing Intel can make. We have a building with thousands of them in there. Okay. 
Uh, then I said, then my son buys the fastest thing because my son was making a movie at the time, right? But not quite as fast as our servers. He buys a fast desktop. I said, I have a one level down because I, I, we don't do development on my machine. My machine's a management machine, right? That's this. My wife's using a Centaur chip, right? Because what does she need better than that? Because here's what she does, right? I said, so there's that spectrum in the world, but down here where my wife is, this is that's 95% of the world, right? And that's what we're, maybe it's 90%, who cares? That's what we're targeting. Right. Ordinary people doing ordinary things, and that's what the piece, that's why the PC is, is, is so valuable. That's where all the volume comes from, and so we built a part for those people. And yes, we're not as fast as the latest Intel chip. Wait two years, and our today part will be as fast as Intel's chip. You know, we're two years behind them, right? And it's fast enough to do the job. But that never really worked, Kevin. I used to, um, I used to, first of all, no one wants to hear me say we're fast enough. That's not good marketing yeah. <laughs> thing. Well, there's a lot of talk about good enough PCs for, for a long time. Yes. Uh, but that is our story. <coughs> and, uh, Today, I think it's, uh, it's, it's even more, more clear, especially with the price of some of the, you can spend a lot of money on a processor these days and they're very, very powerful, but uh, not everyone needs one. Well, Intel even responded with their Atom processor, which is also a stripped down uh, core designed for more entry level and, and you know, fund fundamental. Right. Right, it doesn't fit. I think the Atom was a good part. They have sort of given up on it though, because, well, the problem is, of course, we all know this, Intel's got a 50% gross margin and a massive R&D expense, right? Yeah. You can't afford to sell those kind of parts. Uh, our strategy was, if you're small, you can build a part that's low cost and do it quickly and because it's low cost, <laughs> you can afford to do it small. And Intel's the opposite. They've got to make a lot of money on every part they sell. Okay. So what, what do you sell most of your parts today? Is it mostly okay. the world? Yes, today? it's all, well, it's not. Over time, uh, HP has been a good customer of ours. Primarily, they did notebook, but primarily uh, uh, terminals that have, no, what's the name? Uh, no, they're term. They're like PCs that have sort of no guts, thin, thin clients. I'm sorry. Um, basically, we're going back to the IBM days. <laughs> Terminals to uh, mainframes, set mainframes. We call them servers now. Anyway, uh, but now all of our stuff is primarily overseas. We uh, Lenovo actually, for example, sells our part today but they sell it only in China, on a Chinese SKU. Uh, that was always sort of my strategy. Um, anyway, that, yes, that's where most of our sales are. Okay. So you've been competing with Intel or in a, a market with Intel for a long time, uh, and the only other vendor that's been competing with them is longer has been AMD. So do you have any Interesting stories around competing with Intel on that, that time? Well, I can't tell you the market and sales stories. I can tell you Apocrypha from the market and sales guys. But I can tell you the story I was involved in, which is the patent suit, of course. Yeah. Shall I tell you about patents? Patents are interesting. <laughs> Maybe. I hate them. Uh, so when we, when we started, we started doing patents immediately. Terry and I both have a good background in patents. Uh, IBM, IBM and Dell. Yeah. Terry, sorry, Terry was the force that got Dell out from under TI patents. He's been home, uh, over a year doing that, Dell. But anyway, because in this business, in tech business in general, you gotta have patents. In particular, Intel has sued everyone who ever did. The, they, we talked about Cyrex, they sued Cyrex 
before Cyrex even shipped one of their chips uh, for patent infringement. For various reasons, and we have our theories, but we don't know, Intel did not sue us um, for several years. So we just kept selling parts and helping. What Intel did in 2001 was to sue VIA for VIA chipsets. At that time, uh, VIA was, had a great market in Intel compatible chipsets because Intel had gone to another kind of RAM, I forgot. Sorry. Hardy, uh, Hardy, Hardy Hardy Rambus. Yes. Is for Rambus. Yes, Rambus, exactly. Where uh, VIA was making chips with good old DRAM, right? And Rambus had problems, so Intel was doing very well. So. VIA was doing very well. VIA was doing very well, sorry. <laughs> yes. So Intel sued VIA over the bus, processor bus patents. And VIA had effectively no patents, no way to answer that. So I remember getting a call <laughs> saying, uh, we got to look at your patents and uh, someone's coming from Wilson Sonsini to talk to you. So pretty soon there's a, a group of lawyers in our conference room and we're going through our patents. We've only been in business for four years now. And uh, no. so we found two or three processor patents that we thought the uh, Pentium 4 infringed. So we sued, we, Centaur and Via, sued Intel for <laughs> the day later they countersued, so clearly they were ready, right? Uh, it's interesting, if you go and look at the material, there's a picture of that in this movie I gave you. Uh, the suit was filed on September the 10th, 2001. Oh, no. Yes, the day before 9-11, yes. And our lawyers were supposed to come down from New York the next day. It took them a week to yeah. make it here. So it's a, a memorable occasion, two different ways. Anyway, so for a year, almost two years, I spent at least half my time on that suit. First of all, I was president of the company. Second of all, all three patents we used, I was an inventor on. Uh, third of all, our lawyers had got me, were able to get me certified as an expert witness, even though I was a party to the trial yeah. until protested, but I was an official for witness. Yeah, and patent suits have many steps before the judge, before you get to a trial with a trial. But because we had sued, so I was, I had done, I have like many days of depositions in. I was testified in front of the judge two or three times before we even got to the day of trial. Since we had sued them first, we asked for a jury trial here in Austin. So we had venue, okay. jury trial. And for the week before the trial, the trial was supposed to start on my son's birthday, April 7th, 2003. I had spent the week locked in a room down to Four Seasons with the lawyers because the entire first day of testimony was me because I was presenting the story of Centaur. We are just a bunch of good old boys trying to lower the cost of computing for you farmers there on the jury. <laughs> and here's all the wonderful stuff we've done. Here's my boy Terry down there. Terry's wearing a, Ilf he would come to all the trial things too so far. He wears a ill-fitting suit and he looks like a typical engineer. We were, and there's that California corporation and there's their New York lawyers. Yeah. We had New York lawyers too, but we had a front man who's the local Friend of the judge, you know, kind of, who'd get up and say, Oh, Yana, <laughs> I'd like to explain these pads, but I want to let my, let these guys do it, you know? <laughs> and there come the lawyers. Uh, anyway, I spent a lot of time on that trial, and we were ready to, to win. I was putting on my tie, which I kept more at work forever, that morning. And I get a call from Winchie saying that they had worked all weekend and they had settled all suits with uh, Intel 
with a, and the suit was a cross-license agreement with all Intel patents. So uh, to me, that is a huge win. You couldn't buy an Intel cross-license right. for any amount of money, and we got one. And uh, it was worldwide, too. So Intel, of course, had done the right thing. When they countersued us, they countersued us in 18 different countries, right? There's run apart. Bill, in fact, I had to send Terry to England for two weeks to be at the English preliminary trials, right? So we had someone who knew something uh, there. I think the way it was going to come down, you know, you get a pretty good feel from the lawyers of, of, of the strength of the case. They were going to win on one of their patents, on MMX. Remember MMX? They have an MMX patent. But <laughs> you know, if you do MMX, it looks pretty clear. And we were going to win on one of our patents, which was a new instruction that they'd put into the um, Pentium 4 that we had invented because they weren't doing MMX. In fact, it goes back to microprocessor for, form. Uh, the, yeah. Well, uh, my version of 3D now. So in 1997 at the processor forum, or was it 98? I can't remember. Uh, AMD stands up to, to talk about their 3D now. And I stand up and present our version, right? And Intel's dead silence, right? And Intel's taken a lot of heat because they don't have, you know, right. a 3D now or uh, They essentially uh, have events uh, that was beyond just integer math that took into account floating point. Yes, floating point. So anyway, and somewhere at that meeting, I don't know if it's public or it's in a private conversation, a Microsoft, re Microsoft representative says the obvious, says Intel's going to do something. And we're only going to do one other, support one other thing. AMD and Centaur are one other thing, you get it? So I and uh, AMD reached an agreement very quickly that we would license their 3D now and uh, salute it, right? Put their trademark on, what have you. And they would get a license to the, our patents related to our technology. Right. Our, yeah, anyway, one of the patents that, were, that was involved in that, one of our patents, is this instruction that Intel probably infringed. But who knows? The suit, many things go into the suit. Uh, later, there was one other suit, if I might mention which I really hated, of course. Apple sued HTC for infringement on their cell phones. You know, HTC, their cell phones, obviously. Okay, well, HTC is a related to BIA. Cher, our chairman of the board, is the CEO of HTC when she is on the board of HTC, right? So yeah. inter, inter, interconnected yes, companies. it's, uh, I don't know what the, the Japanese word is karetsu, I don't know what the <laughs> Taiwanese word is, but interlocking companies, right? And so once again, they come to us for patents to attack Apple. So we sued Apple back in the, the ITC, International Trade um, Commission. And I went up there and spent two weeks in New York with Terry again. And I testified for almost a full day because the number one patent we had to assert was the same patent we had in the Intel case. And I was very painful. I mean, lawyers, lawyers are very good, right? Make you think you're an idiot in 30 seconds. But anyway, that case was, was uh, never went anywhere because it was settled very soon after that. So we've had, our patents have been used in two cases that result in settlements with Intel and Apple, two of the most powerful entities in the world. 
That is a segue I hate patents. I have over 250 US patents. I still hate them. Uh, but it's a necessary life. And we're good, we're pretty good at it here. Ask a question, uh, Kevin. Well, we, we've covered a lot of what, what's happened over the years. Um, your career from IBM through Dell and Sci Projects and, and Centaur. Um, during all that time, what do you think were the high points of your career? Well, I think it's just causing, coming up with the original ideas technical ideas and causing a system 38 to be developed. It was very, very hard. It was hard to do just technically with the technology of that day. It was very hard within IBM. I mean, I fought and pushed and lied and <laughs> cheated and whatever you do to get a project done. And, but technically it was difficult. We're doing 48-bit addressing single level stores in the mid 1970s, right? Yeah. Two, two size page tables, you know, two size of pages, stuff like that. Uh, that I think is the technical high point, certainly from a managerial viewpoint, creating and managing, keeping Centaur alive for 22 years, <laughs> the high point, yeah. managerially. Uh, you say that's been the most fun and rewarding has been the Centaur or yeah. the System 38? Well, it depends. System 38, something, a lot of, hardly anyone knows what it is. I know what it is and I know what became of it. So that's something, it's just a personal thing, right? It was hard to do and uh, I did it. Uh, Centaur is different. Uh, it's hard to do in a way. It's more the feeling, the positive feeling there come from having a company that survived for 22 years, the employees never leave. They like it. Over that time, in fact, I don't know why Obama or Trump never give us an award for this, because we're the perfect, what we have done is bring foreign money into, all of our money comes from Taiwan, really China these days, effectively. Yes. We brought all the money in to provide good jobs here. In our lifetime here, we have spent over $500 million here in Austin. On, we buy from Dell, <laughs> you know, building, uh, you know, people's salary. So we're bringing in money to pay for Americans here. So that's, but that, forget that. I mean, it's providing employment for a hundred people who like it, and it's good employment, it's a good job, we take care of people, that's certainly a great feeling. Okay. Well, so, uh, in one sense, I guess that is, yeah. I have to rate that as my best accomplishment. The other is more personal. <laughs> this is sort of... Well, it points to the importance, it, it, it emphasizes the importance of intellectual property. You know, you mentioned how you know, happy about patents, but patents are extremely important as part of the intellectual property that you've generated. Right. We do it, and we do it well. One other thing, we learned a lot, I'll mention it a little bit, in the Intel trial. We, Intel had thousands of patents. They could find five to assert against us, right? And two of them were thrown out by the judge before we got to trial. We asserted three, one was thrown out. One of the things we learned is it's, I don't want to say it's easy to get a patent, but it's totally different than getting a patent that survives litigation. Mm -hmm. It's relatively easy to get a patent granted. It's very hard to get to win in a patent litigation. And so what we have done, because we, is we focus on good patents by good patents. We don't do patents for their sake. I have. As I said, over 250, I could have a lot more if I just wanted to do patents. We do patents that we think will have value, and the value has to come from the potential of litigation, right? Patents that can survive right. in a court case. Uh, so yes, I shouldn't say I hate patents. I just don't like 
going to patent trials. <laughs> I think patents are useful, they're important, and uh, you have to do them. All right, so then what are you working on right now? Well, first, I'll give you two answers. What the company's working on, what I'm working on, because when we got to 20 years, Two things happened. We had a great party. <laughs> it's highlight. Uh, we have film of it, fireworks, entertainment, you name it. 20 years for a crazy idea. I, I decided it was time for me to stop doing everything I was doing. I'm the only real manager here, and I was driving technical things. I was writing my. Uh, I write my. I've written. Microcode on all of our projects. I did hardware in one, but mainly microcode. Cause. So I have released, I call it I, what you think of it, the project management type stuff I was doing. I still manage people and money. But I started, I assigned my, I appointed myself the research division of Centaur. Because we're a small you team. Yourself as your own CTO, right? <laughs> yes, my own CTO, my own research division. I started a project. It's something I'm really interested in, but it's actually coming out. It's going to have merit because along the way, I grabbed, I got two graduate students from UT, and two other guys contracted from another company. One guy is a world-class person doing the software, and I'm building the hardware for uh, for something that is, uh, I think, going to be quite useful, but it certainly is a lot of fun. And it's, it's, it's a coprocessor to our XA6 processor that has nothing to do with classical computing. It's what the modern trend now, in some degree, is uh, domain-specific architectures. It's a domain-specific architecture. And I'm very interested, I was all the way back in IBM, I always used to believe that I mean, if you want to ramble a bit, processors now, the, the rate of progress is very narrow. If you think about the past, first there were just the basic architecture things and pipeline and then super pipelining, and then there was out of order execution, right? And all along the way, Moore's Law is working fine. And then there's multi core, right? And now, the main thing that our, our, our part that our team is doing is an eight core part. We're the low end of the marketplace. We got an eight core part, 16 meg, L3, you know, I mean, uh, I think, and what's happened now is Moore, Moore's Law is no longer working as well, We're, and the end of the tunnel is in sight. And yeah, we could make a chip with 100 cores on it, and no one would know what to do with it, basically, right? So I've become a believer that the curve is like this of processors. Yet, if you look at their specific computational intensive things in the world, where a specialized architecture can get a 10x increase over our processor, where if we put all of our, the difference between processors now is in tens of percent, you know, you know, Intel's. Intel's are going to be 20% fast or something like that, you know, a new 8-core processor. Uh, megahertz really isn't growing, power's become limiting, the new technologies are just terrible in terms of wire delays. I mean, I'm telling you things that everybody listening to this knows. So I've become interested in building specific architectures for specific problems. Uh, in my case, I'm building something, I'm doing all of the hardware one person hardware project and yet I'm going to provide a performance benefit for this particular th thing of 10x over our 8 core x86 processor. Uh, and I think that is that is an interesting trend. So is it, you know, it's an energy is compute model going forward where you have different processors and do different Yes. The thing I'm building has an, is a processor, has an instruction set, very weird, but it, uh, it's, it goes really fast at, at uh, something that's very important, a very important thing done in the world today. All right, so it sounds like you're being 
still have something, still something in the bag that you haven't let out yet. So. Yes. Uh, so I don't know the timing of this, but I really shouldn't say more about it. But one can look around and think what things in the world need massive performance and everyone's talking about it and everyone's doing it. There's a hundred startups. You could find a hundred startups. <laughs> do, you know, <laughs> do you know Chris Rowan? Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, Chris, you know, has got... Has got uh, former founder of Tensilogo. Yes, former founder of Tensilogo. Well, now he's gone in sort of the venture capital right. with his own money, but he's specializing. He has a chart on his website of hundreds of people working in yeah. uh, this area. Yeah. So it's... But, uh, so that's what I'm doing. Um, well, that sounds like a very interesting project and, a very, and still relevant to what's going on today. So you're, you're still very involved. Right. Well, there's a lot of people doing what I'm doing today. They're all doing it differently, of course, different. Yeah. So, but most, a lot of them, in terms of what people have done so far, we're the first person to marry the specialized compute power with the power of the 8-core x86. This is a coprocessor. We can mix and match. If you've got some, most of the calculations of this domain are straightforward and we do them really fast, mass parallelism kind of thing. But every once in a while there's something that's really weird to do. Instead of doing hardware, it doesn't happen very often, but I don't have to do it because you know, I've got high-speed DMA into the processors, right? They can do it. Yeah. So it's a blend of two computing worlds where each does what it is really good at doing and yet can offload work to the other, other one. Yeah, it's sort of like what IMB does with GP, AMD does with GPUs and CPUs today. It sounds like you've got a lower cost, lower power uh, solution. Well, we chose See, it's certainly lower cost. I mean, nothing, everything's lower cost than what NVIDIA, NVIDIA builds. Uh, 500 square millimeter chips, what have you. We, no, that's not uh, our style. Well, Volt is like 810 millimeter square. Yeah, I know. It's, I couldn't believe they could make a chip that big. Yeah, most people did until they did. Yeah. So it's been, a, it's been a good career. I've done lots of different things. Yeah, what, what would you, how would you summarize it? Uh, <laughs> well, it's a great career, very pleased with it. I would point out that I've been incredibly lucky. I was, I haven't gone into detail, I was a right time, right place, right person in all these things. No. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to, uh, to that opportunity. I mean, I won't go through all details. Uh, but if you, I will mention some. The opportunity I got at IBM, four promotions in the first four years, very rare. Was, oh, there are other people that are smart there too. I was in a group, I was allowed to do things, especially, and I had understanding ma managers. Uh, Michael Dell moves one door away from me, right? I run into Lynn Perum, I run into Wen Chi Chin. These are unique people, right? That's what it takes. And, but I feel that I've done the best. I feel I've taken advantage of those opportunities. And uh, I'm, I started by being excited with the IBM 650. You remember a million years ago yeah. when I was in the 11th grade and uh, seen it grow to what we have today. And that's uh, and it's a good feeling. And I still love the technology and there's still more to do. Get to the work every day too. Yeah. So um, that's great. Uh, I think we've, we've covered the careers. Any last points? I mean, uh, are there any? Do you think if you if you ever come up to Mountain View, and obviously we would love to have you see the Computer History Museum. I'm not sure if you've been to it yet. No, I haven't. Actually. You have your own computer history museum. Yes, in, which in I want to take you to see. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> but, but if you ever get up to, to Mountain View, we'd love to give you a tour and show you. They might, might find some System 38s or other scattered yeah. uh, collections. I'm sure you have things here that I worked on, but I uh, haven't really researched it, don't know. I think that uh, I'll say one more thing. Today, 
there was a massive amount of computer science and theory and really good work in, in, in everything, in languages and processor architecture and technology. I still remember, uh, this is what you get from old people, but I still remember the good old days uh, after we had walked to work uphill through 10 feet of snow. <laughs> There was no we the thing there was no technology base. We hadn't invented the things we did. I remember going back to system thirty eight. Yeah, virtual memory had been around for like four or four years at most in IBM. We didn't know how. Work we're inventing it, right? <laughs> Making models have you. The engineers are dealing with crazy things that you don't have to deal with today. Power supplies, water cooling, and on and on. I th uh, to me, it's very interesting to see it go from a, a very ad hoc uh, industry to something that's quite scientific now, quite uh, polished. Yeah. Well, it has, it's a maturing industry, but at the same time, there's still a lot of room for innovation, like this little side project. Of course. I mean, you can name a whole bunch of things that are important to people that could be important to people today that need computers 10 times faster or more importantly probably need data transmission 10 times faster okay. data bandwidth so yeah and the other thing that really i i don't know what the word is but about my environment when i started no one had a computer yeah well that's not true ibm had a yeah. 10,000 computers a year or something like that, right? And now they're ubiquitous. Half the world has a computer and the other half wants one. And you know, in their pocket or... <laughs> yes. Or, or. So that's uh, that's very impressive change to me, to, to see something that I love and something I, I think, contributed to and helped work and grow from being this this specialized thing to something that ordinary people, it gives, it helps ordinary people's lives, it gives us tremendous value to, to civilization.